So welcome to lunch with the court. Today's speaker is Julia Pollock. She is a creative program manager um, upstairs in the basement. And she creates the art of science, and um, that is on May 5th this year. Yes. Uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to meet some of you, and nice to see some of you. <laughs> oh, wait, could we have the front lights turned down a little bit? Sorry, I used um, ultra-thin uh, typeface, as I like to do, and it's an unwise choice. <laughs> uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, so I always get a little nervous before these, because I think I'm pretty much far afield in the lunch with the core topics. <laughs> um, so what I do is sort of bizarre. Um, I get to make art images using for inspiration and actually using for content uh, images that are created in the core and images created by scientists at the IGB and at the University of Illinois. Uh, so I'll do some starting at the beginning. As some of you may know some of these things already. I have some former art of science people in the audience. Thank you for coming. <laughs> OK, uh, the first thing to tell you is, yay, the spring show. Uh, I forgot to bring down cards. Um, so we have cards that I'll put out um, this week. Uh, but this is the show uh, that's coming up that will be all new work. Uh, it'll be at Cafe and Company in downtown Urbana. It's the cafe down there, if you have been there before. It features the work from last year's show. And this presentation will be about some pieces from Hello? OK. There we go. <laughs> um, so I have, I can't really go. Uh, through very many talks without having people do tiny mini activities because I am someone as we go who I really like to be able to do something with my hands. Uh, sensory learning is really important to me. So you have two post-it notes somewhere around you and feel free to use one for a doodle, uh, but eat your pizza first. No worries. <laughs> There's no rush. And the second one I invite you to share one place in your life um, where you bring aesthetics. Ooh, see, I dropped a word already. Um, so I love art, and art is how I think about the entire world and how I conceive of most anything. Um, and to me, that's really important because it's why I get up in the morning. <laughs> Um, but I also think that when we compartmentalize too many things, I think we think, oh, some people do art, I don't do art. And I sort of believe that art is kind of one of those uh, human instincts. Uh, and I think it can be a little less scary instead of calling it art, like what you have to have done every time is this incredible, finished, perfect, pristine thing. Uh, I like to remind people that it's also about the things that you just bring aesthetic to. And I think everybody's got something in their life that they bring aesthetic to. So maybe your shoes, or maybe the fancy cheese plate you put out at given holidays, maybe the color post-it notes you choose to have on your desk. I feel like all of that is the aesthetic instincts that we have, and I feel like those are important to cultivate, gravita gravitate towards, and share. So I've, I've got my post-its up there, and feel free to add them at the end. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, so a little tiny bit of history. The Art of Science has been going for 13 years, and there have been three artists. I am the third. And basically, we had an outside person come into the institution and see some of the core's incredible images. And I think there were some conversations that were like, oh my gosh, these images are like art. We should put them in art galleries. And I think what's really cool about it is through over the years, the institution has kind of cultivated the position as having someone be the kind of aesthetic vehicle for that work. Um, so there are two other people that did this before me. Uh, a little bit about me as an artist. So each of us, I think, have brought, brought different things to the role. And I think when you hire an artist, you're sort of hiring the sort of unique skill set that makes that person go. And I think that's sort of 
pretty much the same in every field. We might just like <laughs> see it less or note of it less um, in other spaces. Uh, so I'm really interested in abstract expressionism. So like 1950s era American painting. A lot of people like to make fun of them, like Jackson Pollock's and Rothko's and those big paintings where you go to the museum and you're like, oh, I could do this. <laughs> those are my favorite kind of paintings. <laughs> um, I think they capture a really interesting moment because what I think they're really capturing is photography was invented and then suddenly photography was really available to everyone and then we had to have a real reckoning in I think fine art to talk about like we don't you don't need paintings to capture what someone looks like specifically anymore you can still do that but we have this other tool that does that so like what is art even for and I think there's some incredible space for exploration there so those paintings that people make fun of I love to talk about them so if you don't like them come talk to me I'd love to talk to you about them <laughs> um, so as a research and an artist mostly I think my deep thesis I keep trying to like figure out what it is but this came up for me the other week um, so I'm interested in making knowledge and the process of knowledge visible. And not just visible, but kind of experienceable. Um, so I don't really want to write a paper about what I learned. <laughs> I want to make something that you can look at or something you can walk through or something that you can experience. Um, so that's basically sort of, I don't think I could have called it that when I was beginning turning into a real human and getting lots of degrees, but that's where I've sort of landed currently with my artist statement. <laughs> so when I was an undergraduate, I studied English and I snuck into the painting department. I took a lot of painting classes, a lot of performance classes, a lot of video classes. So I did a lot of reading and then I took a lot of art classes. So I created, um, instead of a final thesis paper, okay. Um, Oh, see, this is, my, this is like my basic home setup. I always feel like it's nice to see, like, what are your tools? This is my little, this is my tool set. Um, so I created a performance piece that was like an interactive performance piece about The Winter's Tale, which is a Shakespeare play. And I had everything that I had produced was painted, and then I had a bunch of dancer friends come and actually be installed in my art installation, and then people were allowed to walk through my actual art installation. We could do a whole thesis about that, but it was about uh, The Winter's Tale. There's a moment where a, a sculpture is allowed to come alive, and it's kind of like getting retribution for the things that have been done to it, but I wanted to like have these bodies come alive so that people could actually walk into the art. I want people to be able to see the art. I want them to be able to read it. I want you to be able to like walk in and feel it. So that's something I've always kind of been looking for. So this is like baby Julia art. <laughs> Here's us walking through doorways and weird creepy basements. Um, in my master's was in library and information science. So I am, was a librarian for many years, and this was my master's thesis show for my library degree. So I created a cabinet of curiosity that held all of the different kind of hidden research that librarians do. Like I think, again, in all of our knowledge institutions, there's so much in them, and how knowledge is created sort of seems like, oh, well, it's obvious. It's like in the journals, or it's like in the books. But I actually think there's a lot more unseen things that we don't always get to investigate. Like, you know, who's helping set all those things up? Who's making sure there's a space for it? Who's trying to make sure we continue to ask new questions? Like, there's a lot of labor around research that I think goes unseen. So this pro project was trying to, like, pick out library labor and put it into an exposition so that people could, again, walk into it, creep through it, kind of like pick through it, and sort of like investigate the notes of it themselves. This is my giant cabinet that I built. <laughs> uh, this is my uh, book being transfused with blood with the computer book that was there. We did a lot of studying of uh, e-books and kind of talking about how electronic text is like changing the field of library science. Um, and sort of like 
whatever, a whole nother thesis topic we could get into <laughs> that I'd be happy to talk to you about some other time. But I think it's really important to look at how these technologies are still imbued with the same similar content and knowledge. I think they're just sort of like the vehicle for how we access them and how we know them kind of shifts over time. Um, and this was a project for my digital humanities thesis where I rode my bike across the country and I collected subjective and objective data the whole time. So I took like pictures and journaled and then I actually took geolocation data of like what we've been eating, what we saw, what the temperature was, where we were, our elevation, the humidity, all of these different factors that I could track on my phone. And then I made a big giant project at the end where I compared what could I see and what could I know from the, that subjective data versus that objective data that my phone could collect. Uh, and in the final show, we had some performative work where we were measuring the floor with the giant Gunter's chain, which is how we used to take measurements of how to like understand how big different countries were. Um, so yes, uh, so that was like my research and kind of thesis-y work. And then this is like my private kind of abstract work that is like my meditative work that came into a lot of the pieces this year. So. It's hard to totally define because it's just like something I do, but I have a lot of mi multimedia materials and I make these like drawings. So I usually start with um, a permanent end, uh, pen marker and I'll like make sort of shapes, rocks, kind of thought experiments that go together. And then I layer down a layer of oil pastels, which is the sort of painty part. And then I like rub the colors to Together to kind of create these like color field spaces. Um, that's my favorite part because for me, I think, again, so much of our life is computational. So there's like a real distance between you and what you're working on. So I'm always trying to cultivate more ways to br bring like very physical experiences back into the work. And then, um, then I like scratch the surface with pencils and pens. Um, so those are the drawings that I make. And those will become relevant as we look at some of the pieces from last year. So it's a couple examples. Uh, yeah. Uh, so my process for creating an art of science piece is I collect images from scientists, often from the image of the month as a starting point, but sometimes once we start talking, people are like, well, actually, it'd be better if you use this image or like maybe we could use these images. So it's a real good like jumping off point, but often people get excited and show me what they're really working on and let me into some of the things that might not be, I would say, <laughs> like uh, huge display level images, like the images they care for in their work, but might not be like the most perfect images. Um, so then I think about those, that process is confusing, circuitous, trying to figure out, okay, what am I gonna do with this image? Um, how am I gonna bring my expertise into it, but kind of make sure that the knowledge and the idea is central to the piece? Uh, then I get approval from my scientists, which is always scary, um, but so far has gone really great. <laughs> um, because I think it's important to get uh, consent because we're like using people's research images and make sure they feel on board with the direction I've taken them. But I think that's really an interesting part of any kind of collaborative research is you kind of have to be like, okay, now you have to look at this thing I spent a bunch of time on. Um, and I'm still trying to cultivate better ways to talk about like what a, I don't know, vulnerable moment that is and like how to do that better so that people know how to give you the critiques you need and actually like interact in that moment. Uh, so I'm very interested in that as well. Um, and then I'm always trying to improve the process. How can we make this more better art? How can we make this more better science? How can I make it more interactive? How can I bring people into the ideas in a richer way? Uh, so the first piece from, first series of pieces I'm gonna show you from last year's show uh, are called Profession of Hope. And you can see uh, my scientist collaborator was Grace Tan, and she used a MaxSurf CM Explorer microscope. Um, so our excellent science writer writes our descriptions, and they're really beautiful. Um, 
more than 300,000 different kinds of plants spread across the diverse environments from arid deserts to lush forests. Um, having evolved about 700 million years ago, land plants have survived several extinctions, events that have disseminated animal populations. And yet plants leave deceptively simple lives. By just using water, air, sunlight, and nutrients, they make our world inhabitable. They take up water from the soil and carbon dioxide from the air, putting together sugars that form the foundation of the global food chain and <laughs> bleaching out the oxygen. This is a process is so central to plant identity that almost all the land plants use the same pores called stomata to regulate the gas exchange. Uh, depicted as these small mouths, um, there are microscopic donuts that help plants breathe and control moisture level. The central circular pore is bound to two guard cells that can swell or shrink to open or close the pore. Slow your breathing, take a closer look, look and marvel at the innocuous openings that allow life as we know to exist. Great job, Ananya. Um, so you can see here them at the show. It's good to sort of see them in context to see kind of like how they looked. Uh, so this is the original, one of the original scientific images that I got from Grace. And as you can see, I think this is partly the point where we want to like pick at the art of science. Like this image is really beautiful. <laughs> um, and often the things that I start with are very beautiful. So it's a real question for me, like, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to bring myself into this space so as to not take away from what this is already doing, but maybe to bring different stories back into it? Um, so you can see the little stomata. And what was really cool about the four images that Grace shared with me was she actually um, imaged plants from her like home plant family. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> home plants? So she picked a bunch of leaves from plants that like live with her and she imaged them. So I'm pretty sure this one is an ivy plant that she has in her home. Um, so you can see I've sort of blown out the process and then I took a million screenshots of my Photoshop layers. That's what I'm going to show you. <laughs> um, so here's the original. This is my um, oil pastel drawing that's like in my sketchbook that I spent a bunch of time trying to like build a green kind of layer. And that's it layered into Photoshop. But I'll show you it more exactly. Um, so here we have the st original stomata image. Um, if people aren't familiar with Photoshop, you can see my layers in here. Uh, I put in my green sort of like expressive oil pastel drawing. Um, and then often, you know, the first step into these things, I'll like put something on and then be like, whoa, that looks ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I think there's something cool here, but it was like, ah, oh, this looks like a circus. So I don't know, you spend a lot of time being like, okay, like I wanna add color, but I, I don't want it to look like a merry-go-round. So like, let's see what we can do to shift that around. Um, so even just like adding one dark green layer to that, sort of like toned and evened out the whole piece to sort of be like, okay, this could be a softer color field experience. And then you can see my tiny spots. <laughs> um, so the tiny spots go on all of the sort of mouths of the stomata. And the same, when you're blanketing a color over this monochromatic image, you can kind of lose track of like, what is the important point of this image? And I think that is somewhere where artists can really help with engaging with those images and being like, okay, let's pull out the points that you're actually trying to talk about, to discuss. Um, so I always like to bring up my artist influences. Uh, this is one that I look at all the time, Hilma Af Klimt. Um, I love my American modernists, but I also try to do like, uh, since it's my talk, I'm just going to talk all about me. I think it's really important to try to think about your citations kind of radically as my formal life as a librarian. So I try to like uh, make some statements with my citations. So I think it's really easy for me to go back to Pollock and Rothko and Kandinsky and like the big Amer American painting patriarchy that we love. Um, but I like to also spend a bunch of time making sure the 
painters that I reference are femme painters and not the original like five dudes that we always cite. And I think it's a way like a lot of people can sort of radicalize their citations and think about like, yeah, you got to note the big person, but like, can you add in the other people that you're really interested in? Interesting experiment. Anyway, something I care about. Um, so you can see I uh, created the layer of the sort of color field layer, and then I was going to create like, I did that to each one of the stomata images that I had. It was sort of like, okay, these are lovely. They're very sort of monochromatic. They would be beautiful if I printed them enormous. They would be beautiful if I printed them on velvet. Like, there's something really interesting to, you could just keep them at this moment. And it's always a question to me about like, okay, what do I do more is the big question. <laughs> um, so in this case, it was sort of building another eye on top of the eyes that I wanted you to look at. Um, so you can see these sort of soft radial images, soft radial images, and then I have to like slowly erase all the little mouths so they like pop out of that central sort of like disc. Um, and this, again, is sort of the hooey-gooey kind of arty part of it that's like I'm interested in making the image kind of breathe. Like I want it to come alive a little bit. I want you to like sort of fall into it. And again, I think the original monochromatic image is beautiful and like really cool. I think there's something I'm trying to say here about this is a meditative moment to really look at this surface of a leaf and think about how long plants have existed on this earth before us and how they've made the earth for us and how they're really playing the long game. <laughs> it was really amazing to do these pieces. It made me really feel aware of how plants are like dinosaurs living among us. And it made me think about their power in a really different way because I think we sort of, we're humans, plants, they stay in one place, they're plants no offense to plant people <laughs> who know that that is wrong. <laughs> but I think as a general thing, we sort of walk, you know, they're just sort of, you know, we see them in a, in a like, oh, there's a nice plant. Uh, but this was a really interesting way to look at that uh, microscopic image and say like, oh my gosh, plants are these like breathing dinosaurs that are like making the world safe for us. And I think that was a pretty, it's a cool experience to have. Um, so yeah, that's the final progression from uh, stomata to image. Uh, so the next series I had are, again, I was trying to really bring in my drawing this year in a way that I haven't in other years. So the next series of seeds, these are velvet leaf seeds uh, taken by uh, the micro CT scanner, which is super cool. Uh, this is Jim Dolling, a professor here. And they're looking at um, how uh, fungi and other things will enter the seed during its growing process and how that will affect its growth. And by, stop me if I've gotten anything wrong, by using a micro CT scanner, you do not have to dissect the seed at every phase of development. So you can actually image while it's growing. So there's a real possibility of seeing, okay, how is this actually changing through while the seed develops instead of having to stop, dissect every single time uh, you're trying to see a phase of change. Um, so this is the, the first image in a series of five. They're very lovely descriptions, but I thought I'd keep going because I, I think I'm going a little slow. And we'll get into that. Um, and I wanted to give a shout out to Claudia Lutz, hey, um, who names all the pieces. Uh, and this series of seeds were all Slavic, um, like goddesses or like features in Slavic mythology. So the final piece uh, was called Makosh's Cave. Um, so sometimes it's literally translated to mean Friday, but it's a moist mother earth and thus the most important and sometimes only goddess in the religion. As a creator, she is to have been discovered sleeping in a cave by a flowering spring. 
uh, by the spring god Jirla, with whom she created the fruits of the earth. She is also the protector of spinning, tending sheep, wool, patron of merchants and fishermen who protects cattle from the plague and people from doubt and disease and drowning and unclean spirits. <laughs> um, so again, I always want to bring in that it's like a big collective experience. Like I get to make the art, but I get to make it because of all these images that are made on beautiful microscopes by excellent scientists. And then we have our science writers who help me produce the kind of like words that people can actually engage with to kind of add yet another poetic layer to the experience of coming to an art show. So here is the original seed images. And again, this is beautiful. I think it's a beautiful image. And I think the thing um, more that I get out of getting to do art of science is not because I'm like, ooh, I need to fix this. I don't, that's not really the space that I start at. I think it's more like, this is really cool. And because of our infrastructure and how we think of images within science, you know, it's for journals. And then, then it's sort of like, well, they live there. And they're so cool. And it's like, oh, what if we could just invent a lot more ma ways to pull those, those images back out of journals and give them whole other lives so that people can see them in different spaces who might not be reading scientific journals. Um, so I'm coming back to showing you my like sketchbook because again you'll then you'll be able to sort of see how I was bringing my sketchbook process into these art of science pieces. So this each one of these images I like hand pastel drew these like color field beds for these seeds to lay in. So for me it was kind of thinking about the earth that these seeds are going to like be in, and instead of, again, I think it seems very simple, but I think we think of like soil, and it's like, it's just brown soil. <laughs> and I'm sure soil people will tell you that is not the case, <laughs> you know, and how might a seed experience the soil, not as this thing that I see as a human as like an underground thing that's kind of like, oh, it's sort of all the same, it's kind of brown, it's under the ground. You know, a seed is going to experience that soil by being like, oh my god, <laughs> there's so many nutrients here. <laughs> um, so it was really trying to be like, okay, like let me build them this like earthy bed for them to live on and sort of be like, ah, oh, yes, we will be able to develop here. Um, so again, here's my Photoshop and all my layers I'm going to show you. Uh, so here's my original drawing. And you can see it feels very, like, light. I, get, I, I thought this would be fun. <laughs> but, like, you can see, like, okay, it's just my drawing. And then there's, like, really light overlays of soil. Because I really, it was fun to do my drawings. But as I was looking at them in relation to the seed, it was sort of like, I have a texture. The seed has a texture what texture is going to bring those things together. They're sort of too far afield. Um, so it's like, OK, I'm going to bring in this seed texture. And then I'm going to like darken the silhouette space for my seed to sit. And here's my seed in the sort of bed that I brought up. You can see I added another layer of soil. Because again, once you see the sort of crackles of how one organic image on top of another organic image are kind of working with each other in Photoshop, you can really try to play with those layers a lot more like a painting um, if you can pull those in at the same time. That's like, I said this at my last talk, but if you're ever trying to make some complexity in your Photoshop project, take a picture of a real life thing in the real life world and bring that into your Photoshop. Vector generated colors and image fields are very consistent. So often they'll look really flat to the eye. And by bringing in just like very soft textures of actual organic shapes, you can really shift the kind of depth of your image. So here you can see the kind of step process that I've gone through from velvet leaf to kind of painting to, uh, or velvet leaf seed to painting to velvet leaf seed painting together. <laughs> so this piece is called Lazarin's 
crossroads. Uh, the scientist collaborator was Kazi Rabi, um, and they used the micro CT scanner again. Last year, there was a, a lot of really great micro CT scanner images. Um, so the, this one, the description is, what do refrigerators, steam power plants, and sewage treatment facilities all have in common? They all use heat exchangers, systems that transfer heat between two or more fluids optimizing temperature regulation. Such arrangements are also found in nature as seen in the circulatory system of marine animals. Arteries to the skin carry warm blood and are intertwined with veins from the skin they carry cold blood. The resulting heat exchange reduces heat loss in cold, in cold water. This interdependent system inspired by, sorry, the artist, to overlay two different perspectives, a scan of a heat exchanger set against graph paper background, reminiscent of Agnes Martin's work, who I'll show you. Uh, the piece symbolizes the beginning and the end of the design process altogether. An idea is first drawn on graph paper and it later comes alive. So, this is one of the original images of the condenser. So this was a 3D printed metal object that this design engineer is trying to test. Um, so they 3D printed it, but once it's 3D printed with all those cha internal chambers, you can't actually check again to see what is inside those internal chambers. Are they looking right? Are they functioning right? So you can use a bunch of different microscopy process to sort of figure out, okay, did my 3D print go as planned? So these were the two images I landed on to kind of like, or no, this one and the previous one to start the post. But you can see, again, I always want to say they are beautiful images to begin with. So it's a real question for me, like, okay, how am I going to interact with this? How do I want to add story to this without taking away from the labor that is already present in how this image was produced. So here's some more layers. <laughs> um, so I started with the sort of shape of this condenser and I'm sure as you can see, I think it's lovely. It has this like very octopus-like multi-armed shape. Um, and as I was just talking about in the last piece, one of the hardest things I feel like when I'm working in Photoshop is getting texture. Like I think, again, images can look really, really flat. So adding subtle texture is always what I'm trying to do. And almost always I'm actually imagining, hopefully I'll have time to paint every single piece. And so far that hasn't been the case. <laughs> Um, so in lieu of that, it's like trying to be like, okay, how can I bring in as much painting process into Photoshop that I can? Um, so like this is just one sheet of linen. When I was looking at paintings, I really wanted this to have this like very graphical soft pattern. And you can see in linen weavings, it already has that um, web and weft flow in it. So it sort of has that graph paper feel to it already. So here you can see, here's the image the tiny little bit <laughs> of, of that linen overlaid over it. Uh, and then I made uh, a crazy, <laughs> a uh, graph paper uh, to go over it. I definitely did it the wrong way. I like drew each single line and copied them over and made this array instead of using Illustrator just, you know, to torture myself in that moment and find the true meaning of Agnes Martin. <laughs> Um, so they're like a very soft color gradient. One is brown and one is green. And I think the thing that's really cool about uh, hatched lines is like you, there's things your eyes will do with those slight color gradations when there's such pencil thin lines. And you might not even notice the color gradient in here, but it'll actually, again, add that little bit of depth to the image that you're looking at. Um, so here's Agnes Martin, one of my faves. Uh, so she was a painter, again, a U.S. painter. A similar time period, more 70s, and she makes these beautiful graph paper paintings. Again, I think it's one of those paintings that people might see at the museum the first time and be like, what is this? <laughs> um, I love them. I feel like deeply they're about meditation. I think they're about like care. 
I think they're like, ugh, they make me so happy when I get to see them. I think people often react neg negatively to like Pollock's splatter paintings because they're like, what, I can just walk into a room and do a splatter painting. And I actually feel like some of these meditative abstract paintings are a real refinement of what those early people were doing. So like the expressionists were just saying like, we are just ape of man and we paint like however our feelings call us to feel. Um, and I think this is more saying like abstract painting is this moment to try to create a feeling and cultivate this very subtle moment and then try to share that moment with someone else. It's like I want to create this quiet space and then I want to like share that quiet space with you, <laughs> which I think is like one of my favorite things that can happen and something I'm always trying to reach for. <laughs> uh, so you can see here's my Agnes Martin uh, montage. And then these are the sort of like funny layers that get, it, get added in. They're sort of these like subtle glows that sort of add again, how do you create depth in digital images that are essentially flat? And so it's like, how do I make these kind of glowing, sort of breathing spaces in the images? Um, so you can see I've layered them. And again, these are points where I often hit problems because it's like, okay, this is an interesting image, but it's kind of flat. Like, what am I supposed to look at first? Um, and then it's sort of a question of like, okay, how do I bring back the centralized forms of these shapes to make sure they don't get too uh, lost. Um, so I'll show you this. So it, it feels very subtle. Maybe you didn't notice. Um, but like once you've added too many Photoshop layers to something, it sort of like gets kind of ghosty and lost. <laughs> and it's like, OK, I don't want to spend so much time like fiddling around creating texture that I'm losing what's actually important, which is this like beautiful curvature of this condenser. So it's like, okay, now I have to add the condenser back in again as a soft layer to make sure that that's the most important form. So I like build a bunch of really soft layers to try to get the texture that I want. And then I have to like reimpose the image back into it multiple times to be like, okay, that's what I want you to look at. That's the part that's the most important. So you can see like here's the shape again and then add it back on top of it. Suddenly that's sort of like, oh, okay, this is the cool octopus <laughs> for, this, uh, for this image. Um, and similarly with the internal sort of view of the condenser, I really liked this space and I tend to have a, <laughs> a preference for images that are kind of like sad and soft. <laughs> and often I have to like deny that temptation a little bit and be like, no, it can be more punchy and more colorful. Like, let's make it shine. Um, so even just like, I know, again, it sounds silly, but like bringing in these like popping the colors in it will sort of like create these glowy spaces. So then suddenly you have like this background, this sort of like mid ground, and then this foreground of like the object that I want you to look at. So there you can see all interesting options to talk about these images, but I was trying to combine a bunch of different uh, sort of statements about art and about feeling into how I interacted with those pieces. And it's like, I don't want to lose your original scientific image. Like, I don't want it to be gone. <laughs> I want it to be there, but I also want to work with it and try to figure out how can I make it into a poem that is talking about it. So what are the like veils of interaction that I have to add to it to kind of make it, I think, say what it's trying to say in the first place, hopefully. <laughs> um, so this was a kind of tricky one uh, because it's actually more of an infographic almost than an art piece, but I think there were a couple interesting elements about it. Uh, so this was Yi Feng, he, and Yi Feng does modeling. And modeling's always something, again, when we're talking about how I'm always trying to improve, it's sort of a hard form to work with, I think, with the art of science. A lot of the organic shapes that are actually from like real objects and biological entities that are imaged are a lot, you know, like they, they make the art quicker for me. Whereas these are like, okay, this image is already generated. Like, what, is, what does it need from me? Um, 
So this person studies agricultural data over many spans of time. So they generated me maps of soybean yield in the Midwest and Champaign County in general. Uh, this was the first image I got. Yay. <laughs> I think it's like one of those pretty standard like images you get in a presentation. It shows these sort of years in a row. Um, so when I was looking at that, I was like, okay, what is this made of? They're made of all of these um, uh, counties. So I got a huge county map, and the sort of fun thing I did was being like, okay, how can I bring some kind of expressionism into this piece? Uh, so Avis Newman is another artist that I love. Again, another sort of abstract expressionist, a London artist who makes these drawings that I always feel like um, kind of look like if you were trying to draw the way like birds would move around. <laughs> this is what these paintings look like to me. If you like attached a little pencil to like, you know, a bunch of creatures moving around or clouds or something, there's these kind of like stormy, very organic painting drawings. Um, so I really like to, again, bring in those organic shapes when the pieces are so structured and then also bring in structure back in when they get lost. <laughs> Um, so I made this big giant kind of Avis Newman swirl that's made up of all the tiny little counties that this person is taking data from. So I took all the, these counties, made shape files, and then I made them into this like whirlwind of shape files. <laughs> you can see. Ah. <laughs> um, so the first version of the piece, I painstakingly tried to Photoshop every single one of those images to try to change the actual um, projection of the map and this is one of those times in art of science and I think maybe in life where it's important to like say that was a mistake because anyone who works in modeling will tell you no 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 I can just use a different map projection <laughs> if you'd like a different map projection um, and I think again these sort of basic points of collaboration it can be difficult to know what questions do I actually have for you <laughs> in this interaction and how do I know what I can ask you to do like I don't know what all of your modeling processes can do I don't know how adept you are at different layers of those things you know I didn't even realize that I had spent a bunch of time doing something and I sent the images back to the scientist and he was like well I could just print you I could just make you different images to help you with this process. And I was like, great. Um, and I spent a bunch of time being like, well, I was trying to do this Avis Nuvis painting thing. I was trying to like put these colors on here. I want it to be like, it's like a map and it's zooming out and pointing to each other. And he was like, okay, cool. But I feel like nobody would know what I study in this. Like, I feel like maybe this doesn't make sense. And we talked about it a bunch and we kind of talked through the images. And I was like, no, I think we can fix this and kind of bring more information back into the piece. Um, so I kept my swirly county circle. <laughs> uh, and he made me new images, which was awesome. Much flatter, much better, much easier to work with. But I think, again, just sort of vaguely in scientific terms, it's stuff you guys come up with all the time because you're using all different programs to create lots of these different things. So like setting all the type standards, setting all the image standards, I'm sure like trying to like standardize that cross prog programs is exceedingly difficult. <laughs> so I spent a bunch of time redrawing these things. And anyways, it's just a problem with research imagery. It's hard to standardize it. Um, and built this kind of before and after infographic for people to look at. Um, so I give you a close-up of my soybean yield graphs Ooh. and my temperature graphs. Oh no, temperature's going up. <laughs> we all know it. Uh, and the graphs down the middle were showing um, 10 years ago and current 10 years. So like doing a 10-year comparison year by year of soybean yields in the Midwest. Uh, so you can kind of see closer up because I know on the screen it's sort of hard to get close to it and see all the little data. Um, and their real point was trying to kind of say, you know, like, it's really important to be clear about how the climate is shifting and how, like, we need to bring all of our resources to figuring out what are we going to do about food security? What are we going to do about climate change? Um, but it was really cool because this scientist was also feeling like it was really important to say, 
we actually scientifically have made some incredible strides in figuring out how to increase yield. And like, that's not nothing. <laughs> it's like a really important thing to like acknowledge and honor that we figured out. And yeah, I'm sure there's lots of new things that we need to figure out and problematize about how that works and what that will mean for our systems. But like taking that moment to be like, no, we figured some things out about how to increase agriculture scaled up on these huge levels. And that's going to be really important for continuing to exist as humans on this earth. Um, so it was a cool process because, again, got some feedback, tried to rework it, ended up in this sort of infographic space. And this is sort of each one of these images is sort of its own separate experience with the person I'm working with. So thank you so much for coming. Again, you have post-it notes. If you would like, you can leave a doodle or you can share one place in your life where you bring aesthetics. Uh, and I have a, a table up here. If you would like to share, I would love to hear about it. And the spring show is May 5th at Cafe and Company. And you can see more such drawings, new drawings. There will be giant bee brains. There will be bundle sheath cells. There will be colorectal cancer. There will be, <laughs> um, there will be uh, ice storms from a climate, uh, a climate scientist. So come, enjoy. There will be delightful food and beverages. And it's always a nice time. So thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm happy to take questions if anyone has any. I know it's always a weird talk. <laughs> that was great, thank you. Um, do you only accept like uh, images created in the core, or will you accept like things done on outside scopes? Uh, we we generally like to make sure we feature like internal ones as part of our spring show. But we're totally, I'm totally always open to people who are IGB affiliated or people at the wider university to talk to. Because we're talking about research done at the university. So it's important in our spring show to feature our work and what the core is doing. But I think art of science continues to keep expanding and going lots of different directions. Do you have cool images? Yeah. Yeah. OK, sweet. <laughs> Cool, cool, cool. Okay, talk to me after. <laughs> I think everyone's always trying to improve their skills at getting out important issues. Um, I think, I guess I always feel like the answer to that is often like, part of the infrastructure that's already there. You know, like I think there's sort of like culturally at a certain point we decided that science was important and we like continued to fund it and create giant institutions around it. Um, but I think it's always important to like sort of say like, oh, is that message that we first began with saying science is important, is the, are we saying why science is important in the same way that we used to be saying it, or are we updating everybody on all the new ways that we're saying it? So I don't think it's necessarily like ill-equipped. I think it's just like, it's like working with legacy problems, I actually feel like is often where communication can get kind of lost. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who will respond to my emails? <laughs> um, you'd be surprised, yeah. Like, I think um, some people get like, oh, I don't know what this is. <laughs> They're like, oh. um, And then some people are really pumped and excited about it. And, you know, everybody's got a lot to do. So sometimes you don't have time for all the things you want to do, too. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do, I definitely like see ones on image of the month and I go, wait, Glenn, who did that one? <laughs> that one's so good. <laughs> um, but yeah. So uh, my, Claudia names them, sorry. 
I shouldn't shout her, she's here. Um, I think the naming process is really cool, um, but we're like super, it's awesome to have words people to work with. Again, like whenever can I can bring a collaborative part into the work, I really want to, because I am not inherently a words person or like a written words person. Obviously I talk too much, but the like, the actual like written words for things, for me it's really fun to see like, okay, I did this thing, this is, these are the notes that I was taking. So I could even show you the like silly notes I leave for a Nanya, our science writer. I have like what my scientist told me, I have my like wacky artist notes, and then she does this like combination of what those things are to create these descriptions. And then we've, last year, um, a couple years before, well, sh she could tell you more about how she did them in the past, but I won't put her on the spot if she doesn't want to. <laughs> Okay, um, but then I like give her the descriptions and the images and I actually feel like I don't know if I'm right But it's like a weird fun poetry game because it's like here's a thing and here's a thing. What's it called? <laughs> um, so I leave that to someone else, but I'm hoping that the fun of the association game sort of I think it comes through because they turn out really cool <laughs> Yeah, yeah, go ahead You have a show, and then you want to have a show about the show, and then keep having shows about the show. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 